Uh, the boots were actually sent to me. Sent to you? Yeah. What does that mean? Um, just because I'm like an Instagram influencer, so they sent me like the free shoes. How do you become an Instagram influencer? Um, I wow. love it. There is no denying that the social media influencer phenomenon is a huge part of our contemporary culture. In our highly digital age, there seem to be no way of getting online without bumping into a swarm of self-appointed experts in makeup tutorials, fitness coaching, cooking recipes, dance routines, or people whose only occupation is, um looking gorgeous in every situation and although the subject of influencers is largely covered these days in this video what I am NOT gonna do and I mean I will at least try is make a critique about whether if it's good or bad you know the fact that influencers exist or if it's okay to indulge in following them I mean there is plenty of videos that you can find online that do just that what I do want to do, however, is look at influencer from the perspective of social and cultural history. Why are there influencers at all in the first place? Where does this culture of homebrew public personality even come from? I will further focus on exploring the historical examples which created a precedent to our current trend of social media influencer, as well as on origin of the role of lifestyle in all of it. So, without further ado, here is my take on the cultural wave that is the cult of the internet personality. Welcome to the history of social influencer. 1. The Basics So, the first thing I needed to ask myself while doubling in this subject is why? Why is this relevant? And apart from the obvious experience of being online and being drowned in seemingly endless algorithm suggestions of content of the seemingly famous strangers, the answer chiefly lies in the factual research. Statistically speaking, the influencer market was valued at 3 billion of dollars in 2017 and was expected to grow to a staggering 9.7 billion of dollars in 2020. So, this is no mere innocent selfie dump or jokey dance routines on TikTok. The influencer culture compounds to a massive segment of economy in of itself. We also know that its everlasting presence in turn has an obvious impact on our perception of beauty standards and negatively affects our mental health. Another thing that had caught my attention is the 2019 Harry's survey, which focused on exploring children's career aspirations, asking them who they would like to become when they grow up. And unlike jobs such as doctor, lawyer, or an astronaut, the top position in US and UK alike is, um, you guessed it, a content creator. This is a chief aspiration of young kids these days. And I don't want to sound like a moralist here, you know? I don't want to be all like, Oh, those pesky kids these days, oh lord. With the omnipotent presence of internet and the seemingly fun and easy aspects of internet influencer, who can really blame them for having such an impression, right? But before we get into the details, it is important to understand the fundamentals and the context here. According to Uncle Google, social media influencer is a user of social media who has established credibility in a specific industry. He or she has access to a large audience and can persuade others by virtue of their authenticity and their reach. The influence itself means the capacity to have an effect on the character, development or behavior of someone or something, or the effect itself. Simply speaking, it's a widely understood act of persuasion. According to Merriam-Webster, the world's first recorded use of the word influencer was in the year 1662. 
Of course, there were plenty of people who were influential throughout history, and because of different reasons. Great rulers, political reformers, music geniuses, religious and philosophical preachers. People were also influential by proxy, in creating or discovering new things that were in themselves influential to our civilization. It is also important to understand that influence is heavily intertwined with other social categories, such as power and fame. These things rely on one another and are not mutually exclusive in of themselves. Fame is a mode of recognition. Influence is what you can do being backed by that recognition. Power, on the other hand, in itself intrinsically gives you influence. Since having power, you can implement your own policies on things, the influence is a given aspect of power. That's why, for the purpose of my video, I am not focusing on any figures who had influence as a consequence of having power, but rather on those who created influence out of thin air and because of that gained power. Prior to modern times, there were plenty of historical figures that fall into this category. To name a few, we had people like Beau Brumel, a famously elegant 19th century Brit of the middle class background who rose to the top of social creme de la creme chiefly by reinventing and dictating a self-devised impeccable style of menswear which favored tailoring and muted palette over volume and color along with cultivating detailed grooming habits and a wry blasé persona all of which granted him a favor and a brief friendship with Prince Regent. Coming from a relative obscurity, he got so popular to a point where famous Savile Row tailors made him garments free of charge as a way of advertising their business to a British high society who widely recognized him. Esquire magazine names him a precursor to a social influencer, reinventing the look and feel of men's fashion along with cementing a certain air of fashionable condescension which, because of him, are still prevalent today. Another such social career maker was Rasputin, an early 20th century notorious religious mystic who, upon leaving his village in rural Russia, went on to ascend to a imperial inner circles in St. Petersburg, and is chiefly famous for gaslighting Russian empress to the point of her contributing to the fall of Russian Empire. He owns all of this to the interpersonal fame that is granted by his spiritual guru, widely regarded, awe-inspiring persona. And just like the internet celebrity, or any celebrity really, both of them had a very strong sense of self and understanding how they come across to people and have played all of that to their own best advantage. That, in turn, had helped them in bettering themselves on the social and economical ladder. Another aspect that caught up early on in understanding how to acquire social influence was through the obvious, sex. Before the avalanche of thirst traps and emergence of OnlyFans, and even before the notorious celeb socialites Paris and Kim dropping their famous saucy tapes, the good old fucking help plethora of individuals in bettering their social reach. Madame de Pompadour, for example, famous lover to French King Louis XV, knew it. Through royal bed, she had secured a noble title, along with building a network of connections and supporters, and in turn of having king's favour, she went on to personally provide a patronage over the development of arts, architecture, interior design, philosophy and literature of what we call today French Rococo period. 
Additionally to Pompadour, the maxim that sex sells was equally cultivated by the whole array of Belle Epoque high-class prostitutes. It was Amelia Dalençon who fancied herself as an actress, but was better known as the woman who'd all but bankrupted King Leopold II of Belgium. There was Leanne de Pougy, who, when shown a million and a half francs worth of jewels by her lover of the moment, became paralyzed with indecision, thus obliging him to buy her the entire display. He later became a nun. There was La Bella Otero, Spanish dancer, provoker of suicides, lover of at least six crowned European monarchs, whose breasts served as models of the cupolas on the new Carlton Hotel at Cannes. So, whether it is by the means of intensely engineered social persona, or by flaunting your who has to the right people for social gains and amassing following, these phenomenons aren't, strictly speaking, modern. But there is more to simple posturing for one to become an influencer. To affect people with the monopoly of your persona, you need to get yourself documented. 2. I am depicted, therefore I am. Okay, I'm gonna get a little bit philosophical for a second here, but bear with me, okay? I want you to take a moment and think about the quote you're seeing here, and think of it in the context of an image. I don't see me only as I am, but I see me how I long to be. Pretty deep, huh? The images had a long tradition of generating a sense of self-perception. Seeing oneself outside of your existence, on paper, painting or a photo, helps us understand our own presentation and our own relationship to the environment which we are presenting ourselves in. It is not merely a snapshot but a psychological tool of comprehension which helps us with our intentions both towards ourselves and towards wider public. That's why, before Paris Hilton's very predictive famous saying, and since the beginning of tradition of commission portraiture, the images had always been a beacon of what is called a social currency. Images also helps us test out variations of different identities in a playful way. We think of Instagram, TikTok or Snapchat filters as a new phenomenon, but actually that playful aspect of goofing around with self-image was already utilized in the so-called talk miniature portraits, a fashionable genre of painting in the Baroque era. With the help of a little transparent film, the subject could play around with their imagery self-styling and attain a different personas, putting to test a little scenarios of what could have been. As here for instance, changing your gender and becoming a Middle Eastern dignitary, a convent nun, a foreign princess, or even in this case as an um, um, interracial sexual adventurer? She's a hoe, but she knows how to have fun. She's a fun hoe. <laughs> I gotta admit uh, brownie points for a sense of humor in this one. This is a um, pretty edgy joke for a 17th century, I gotta tell ya. <laughs> But anyway, historically speaking, people have always longed to present themselves to themselves while exuding a sense of self-understood aspiration or accomplishment. When we look at Instagram, I would say the biggest and the most accurate predecessor to an Instagrammer was a man called Matthias Schwartz, born in 1497 in Augsburg, Germany. He is famous for his book called Kleidenbuchlein. Ooh, look at me doing German. A book of clothes, which is a collection of 137 images documenting Matthias' um, looks. Hey, Matthias' looks. That's what they are. They were meticulously recorded over 40 years between 5020 to 5060, a quote-unquote selfie record unmatched until the advent of photography. And although commissioned with four local painters as he wasn't an artist, Matthias himself chose all the clothes, poses, details and backgrounds he wanted. And just like in today's Instagram post, funnily enough, Matthias also placed captions. 
a neatly calligraphed paragraph boasting of savvy color palettes and fabric choices as he plans spectacular new outfits for a bewildering variety of occasions, from funerals to um, falcon hunts, as one should. Yes! Yes! You look so good! And since part of his employer's merchant empire involved the international textile trade, Matthews may have boosted his career by advertising the company's product, the fabrics that his clothes were made of. I mean, do we, do we see a pattern here? No? No? It is incredible just how similar the book itself resembles our modern Instagram feed. I mean, just look at it. <laughs> Historians agree as well that Kleid und Buchlein raises important questions about the meaning of self-fashioning, both now and then. But chiefly, it also illustrates how Matthäus advanced politically and socially by carefully managing his image at a time when you were what you were and how you appeared, much more so than today. 3. The Role of Lifestyle But still, there is more on the table than just a case of self-identity. The main goal is to get people invested in your broader life, and that requires the amount of invention directed towards not just you, but your own environment, which you inspire to represent with your persona. This is directly tied down to what we see today in the so-called flex culture. An educated sense of well-crafted interior design, holiday destination, choices in product consumption, and the whole aesthetic of it. All of that serves to generate a visual interest that in consequence breeds real interest in influencer's life and everything he or she represents. This is an art of commanding an audience just by an act of aspirational living. But here again, broadcasting your lifestyle isn't something inherently new to the internet culture. We had emergence of reality TV in the early 2000s where you could see people's every aspect of daily life. The famously notorious Kim Kardashian made bank for herself and her family simply doing just that for more than a decade, to a point where she acquired top position among the ranks of celebrity. And looking further into history, the idea of private life lived as public life was known way before 20th century. The idea was highly cultivated throughout royal courts for a long time, but it got really intense with the reign of Louis XIV. The so-called Sun King, a famous absolute French monarch, saw himself as a demigod. He devised a concept of etiquette a tight web of intricate and highly regulated ceremonies that dictated everyone's order as well as his own daily demigod life. From now on, the future French monarchs under the old regime were subjected to it in every minute detail. The kings and queens woke up, ate, presided and went to bed in the presence of an audience. The queens even gave birth in public, which is crazy. They were publicly dressed, groomed, and handed things by people who fought hard to acquire this privilege to do so. The Louis XIV to XVI lived to be seen, and witnessing things at court firsthand was the highest source of public interest. But not only the monarchs propagated a tasteful and broadcasted way of life. With the constant expansion of French arts, crafts and luxury goods, the upper-class Parisians reveled in cultivating a sense of tasteful lifestyle as a benchmark of expression of their culture. These engravings by Jean Moreau de Younger brilliantly depict various scenes of noble houses' everyday life. Their artistic aim was very purposeful in illustrating all the stylishness and poise of their subjects, lounging in rooms full of perfectly conceived interiors and rarefied luxury goods, which created aesthetically concise, desirable and highly envious image of society's life. 
These are lifestyle pics as we know it on the 18th century terms. The images were quite famous in their day, being reissued and republished many times, creating a further expansion of desire for French way of life. By putting to expert a tastefully sophisticated culture, France went on to be emulated throughout the world, becoming synonymous with luxury goods to this day. This is basically a collective lifestyle propagation and broadcast on a worldwide scale before the birth of media, and something we get to see today but on a much more individual scale with the use of Instagram. Lifestyle and consumption were intertwined with each other since the very beginning. And with today's problems of overproduction and contamination, consumption as a phenomenon has acquired a rather negative connotation. But that wasn't always the case. In 1950s, US cultivated consumption of goods as a response to post-war rebound of economy. It was regarded not only as a consumer activity, but a sense of patriotic duty to consume goods and services. And with increasing prosperity of everyday citizen, it was much easier to participate in it and cement it as a part of American culture. The act of collective consumption got so big to a point where in 1960s Andy Warhol made a name for himself by elevating the idea of consumption to a form of art. Among his famous Campbell soups, Andy Warhol is famous for his screen-printed colourful portraits of stars, which were highly coveted. People sought after to be depicted by Warhol in the same manner as the envisioned Elizabeth Taylor or Marilyn Monroe. Warhol charged anything between 50 to 100k to do that. But the joke was on the subject himself. People, by seeking emulation of depiction as their favourite star, merely showcased them as a stand-in for someone with true recognition, a sort of pretender to a sense of personal brand. It was the nobody's portrait as somebody, creating the visual representation of the tangible discrepancy of recognition. Fame was Warhol's main point of interest as an artist. By the way of exhibiting, his art seemed to conflate the value of fame of a household product that is interchangeable with the fame of a celebrity. It equalizes fame between people and objects under the blanket of the same unifying sense of desire and glamour. His work irrevocably tied consumption with identity and identity with consumption, which is a very foundation of a modern understanding of lifestyle. This was echoed again very heavily in 2000s. The noughties pop culture is a very direct descendant of Warhol's philosophies. And before the monopoly of smartphones and advent of social media, here we have celebrities at height of their fame and the culture of being surrounded by paparazzi, which was both the cause and the result of popular interest of crazy proportions in private life of stars. Britney Spears, Paris Hilton and Kim Kardashian seem to embody everything that everyone loved. I want to be that, I want that lifestyle. People yearned for this romanticized pop idea of paparazzi paparazzi defined fame, because in 2000s it seemed so glamorous. The public investment in viewing photos that gave little sneak peeks into famous people's lives generated obscene amounts of money. The money mains were further motor for the glamorization of this lifestyle. In the bigger picture, it grounded further this sort of magic formula that controversy equals fame equals money. But chiefly, it completely normalized both the interest in watching others and a desire for being watched. And then, internet blew everything up to pieces and democratized this whole space, leading to the abolishment of monopoly the traditional media had on who gets to be seen. Now, with the rise of social media, everyone could redirect their attention on themselves, garner an investment of other people's interests, and have their 15 minutes of fame. The attention became the ultimate currency of our culture, and photos 
generated an adjacent economy, which promoted consumption of products that fueled the whole game. But we must remember that with the images representing lifestyle, we don't aim to consume products, we consume identities. The idea that if you live your life stylishly and if you display it tastefully, the very art of beautiful living can be self-funding itself. You can earn tens of thousands of dollars by simply documenting the seemingly intrinsic value of the bougie existence. The idea like this gives such a strong promise of social and economical mobility. In short, it is so tempting to people because going viral is the emotional equivalent of winning lottery. 4. Fame aka make it till you fake it. Oh my god, yes! Andy Warhol is famously credited with saying that in the future everyone will be famous for 15 minutes. Time magazine declared that Warhol nailed it. Not only has his prophecy eclipsed his fame, but as a cultural observation, 15 minutes has had its 15 minutes. That article is from 2006. It's been a very long 15 minutes. And as the cameras kept shrinking and screens kept multiplying, everyone understood that with the game of internet recognition, it isn't the case of achieving one or two good quality outcomes. The sink or swim lies in copious amounts of repeated appearances. Famous Irish writer Oscar Wilde wrote, There is only one thing in the world worse than being talked about, and that is not being talked about. A century later, our man Warhol echoed his sentiment in saying, Don't pay attention to what they write about you, just measure it in inches. Paris and Kim knew it, and social media hustlers know it too. It's all about quantity. And it isn't so much the truth that matters, but a crushing multitude of self-depictions. And for that, you need to make compromises on the front of authenticity. But then how can you really tell if someone truly shows you what he or she lives through? What if they all just fake it? All of us obviously know that this is an issue these days. There is an entire HBO documentary from 2020 called Fake Famous that deals exclusively with the experiment of artificially engineered clouds that gets you the real deal. But again, we're chiefly interested in cultural point of view here. And this is where the ball comes in. The board is a French theorist and philosopher who wrote his famous book called Society of the Spectacle, and in it he traces the development of modern society in which, according to him, all that once was directly live has become a mere representation. The Bohr argues that the history of social life can be understood as a decline of being into having and having into merely appearing. That is what he calls a spectacle, a social disregard for authenticity where a sense of truth is surpassed with the aspiration to embody mere representation of what you want the truth to look like. To add to this, the Bohr writes that the spectacle is not a collection of images, rather it is a social relation among people mediated by images. As a whole, Society of Spectacle is a critique of contemporary consumer culture and commodity fetishism, and 1960s development and nuancing of advertising industry. But, on the other hand, the board also pretty much tries to prove that literally all that was once directly live has become a mere representation, a falsehood of image, where once, in pre-modern times, we haven't had that. Personally, I'm a bit on the fence with the board's hypothesis. I think it applies to general consumerism, but on the other hand, there were never times really where there was no need for an image or sense of either true or aspirational self-representation. The self-image expressed by the means of commodities is a concept as old as time, and I don't think we can really simply dump it on capitalism. 
The commodities always played a role in dressing up the visual language of our identity, and there wasn't some magical pre-modern time where that didn't happen. That, that's just not true. I think it's just that with the rise of internet, more people have access to the ability for creating widely broadcasted self-representations. I don't think that it is the problem of whether this phenomenon of falsely engineered appearances exist, but so much so as to the extent it occupies the balance of our attention and our everyday lives. So, while people will keep faking till they make it, I think it is paramount to be vigilant about understanding the phenomenon itself and what does it mean in a bigger picture, so that we don't fall for false promises. But, ultimately, first and foremost, we don't take it too seriously, you know? And whether it was Bob Rommel, Louis XIV, Rasputin, Paris Hilton, or if it's you, Regardless of how big or small, how old or young, we all come from a long cultural line of wanting to establish a sense of identity that in turn benefits us back. So in wise words of an old American philosopher, Dolly Parton, find out who you are and do it on purpose. Thank you so much for watching, friends. I know it was a long and intense one. So if you made it here, really, thank you. And what are your thoughts about social media influencer phenomenon? Do drop me a comment below. Like, comment, subscribe, and yeah, see you in another video coming very, very, very soon, hopefully.